Hi everybody, I'm Adam Snow. First of all, congratulations. Um, it's exciting to, I didn't know who got accepted this year, and it's exciting to see the new list and start putting faces to uh, some of you I've met before, others have contacted me by email, and uh, I hope to see some of you in Aiken and get to practice with you. It would be awesome, but it's, uh, you obviously come a long way on your own to get selected into this program, and that, that means that you have um, good minds and a good start from yourself. Um, they asked me to speak about the mental side in polo um, as well as horses if we have time for it. Um, but uh, I, I'm going to run this a little differently and um, I didn't want to be standing up here and lecturing for a long time. I want to try to get you guys and girls involved and um, so that's why I asked everybody to have a piece of paper and a pencil. And um, first of all, I'm going to start with a disclaimer that I am not a sports psychologist um, and therefore everything I tell you is going to be things that I've worked on um, that I feel have improved my mental approach to polo. Um, and the reason that I started thinking more about the mental side and working on it was in 1997, a woman that was getting her PhD from the University of Virginia named Stiliani Crony, who was uh, writing her dissertation on the competi competitiveness in the sport of polo. And she came down here and asked to interview me, uh, Memo Gracida, Owen Reinhardt, Mike Azaro, and Julio Ariano and Hector Galindo. And through the course of this two or three hour conversation with her where she was asking us questions individually, I got interested in what I could learn from her. And, uh, and I think she also probably spotted some things in the way I described uh, polo and my preparation that, that she took issue with and didn't think was the smartest way to, to be as successful and as good as I could be. Um, so what I am going to do is give, hit you with three of the things that we began working on initially and ask you to write down your own thoughts and then I'm going to call on each of you at least one time during the course of this, this talk. And uh, the other thing that I'd like to propose is that when somebody would like to follow up um, that we sort of pause at the, each, at the end of each of these three sections that I worked on with Ani early in my work with her um, and, and we can discuss them in more detail. Um, and um, the first thing that I wanted to discuss, and before I discuss it, you guys have to write down what you think about it, um, is that she, um, not to, for me to worry about what was out of my control, was very important for me to arrive to the field in the best frame of mind. And I would like you guys to each write down a couple things. And this, there's no, this is like kindergarten. There's no wrong answer. So you can't, can't give me a wrong answer. But just in one, you know, 30 seconds, write down a couple of things that could be out of your control as you prepare for a polo game. And then a couple of things that are in your control. And then I'm going to call on two of you. We'll hear from those two and then I'll tell you some of my work with Ani and what were some of the facets that we worked on. And I'm just going to randomly call a couple names because I have the, have the list here. Red, I think you met her, didn't you, when, we were co when you were coaching you were Templeton? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Just whatever jumps to mind, don't make a big deal out of it.
Okay. Um, so how about Remy? You give me something that's out of your control. The other team's horses. Excellent. So the other team's horses. Um, should we discuss each thing, or let's uh, let's just hear? We're going to hear from four people each one of these questions. Neil, something that's out of your control and doesn't help to think about? Um, like the, the weather or something? Yep, the weather. Okay, how about something that's in your control and would be a better thing to focus, going, focus on going into the field? I better put checks on who I called on. Um, Jesse? Uh, you can focus uh, on oh, which Jesse. Which Jesse? <laughs> How about both? <laughs> One at a time. Go for it. Uh, you can focus on like your attitude towards the game, like your confidence level of playing and how you feel towards playing the game. Okay, what would be a specific part of your attitude? Like, because attitude... Yeah, you can, uh, uh, if you're just confident of how you're feeling that day and confident that you can go out there and play your best. Okay, good. Other Jesse? Uh, I was thinking more along the lines of like whether your team's prepared and you're organized when you get to see. So the preparation. preparation yeah. Preparation is definitely in our control. Um, some of the things that I just, you know, jotted down um, that is what are out of my control, and some of, some of you said this already, but as umpires, field conditions, an injured horse that I lost yesterday and I know I can't play it, um, whether the other team has a substitute maybe for their amateur player that's going to be stronger, those are all things that are, you know, I, I can't really uh, impact and effect and it doesn't matter how much I think about it or worry about it it's not going to help me play better when I arrive to the field. Some of the things I wrote that are in my control are my own horses preparing them individually as best you can um, um, my mallets, I mean it sounds like a simple thing but you know picking up a mallet and feeling confident is, is hugely important to me um, and sometimes it's the grip, it's something you've stick and balled with the day before and the ball's been pinging. Um, uh, the way I react to adversity on the field can be something that I sort of try to do some preparation about. Maybe I'm playing against somebody, you know, I really don't like their attitude and they're always going to scream at me and curse and, and maybe I've realized that I play better by being calm through that. Or maybe I play better by yelling back, but I know myself well enough to know how I'm going to respond to that, that adversity on the field. Um, and, um, you know, gen generally my, my mental approach to the game, and this is not specific, this is not like we can say, okay, this is the way to pr prepare for a game because each of us is different. But as you're developing as players, and as we're developing as players, I think it makes a lot of sense to pay attention to when you have good games and what you've done to prepare and, and what, what went into that day before and the morning of, and when you have bad games and thinking about um, what to avoid. And one thing that I would suggest that I've done for the last ever since 97 is keep a little polo journal and you write down whatever thoughts come to mind, whatever you liked from Red's discussion, whatever you liked from my discussion because I think you're, uh, you want to be as open as possible and take it from whatever sources you can and you have a tremendous opportunity to learn from a lot of peer people that have experienced it. Anyway, I'm getting off topic. There's a quote um, that I have to paraphrase because it's from a book. I don't know who said it, but um, God gives me, God, it's sort of like a prayer. God, give me the strength to change the things I can, the composure to leave alone the things I cannot, and the wisdom to recognize the difference between the two. And I think as far as preparing for a polo game, um, that's really important. You kind of say, is that in my control? Yes, it is. I'm going to take care of it as best I can. Is it out of my control? Yes, it is. And there's some things that are in the middle. Maybe you can make a call to see if you can borrow the horse that would help your string. 
but once they say no you can't borrow it boom you put it outside and you you worry about the things that are in your control um, now the preparation uh, for me is very important and uh, there's a quote, another quote that I like, and this is from Alvin Ailey, and it's, um, it just says, freedom through discipline. And I think that the reason I like that quote is that I want to prepare as thoroughly as I can um, about the team I'm playing against, the horses I'm playing, my assignments individually, you know, whether I'm going to the hitter, when he hits the ball, am I allowed to jump to the player that receives it, do, or do I need to stick with him? Um, you know, every little aspect so that when I go on the field, I don't need to think. That's kind of why I like that quote, that it's like, um, for me, uh, kind of putting thoughts away is the way that I feel I can play the best. So the time for me to be thinking about those strategy is is beforehand and that's part of my preparation um, and uh, I guess the other thing that we, we've mentioned it one of you mentioned it and then I mentioned it as the umpires and um, the, uh, the I, I when we won the Open in 2002, we had a shout between me and Tommy Biddle and Miguel Novizio Estrada. Every time somebody lost it at the umpires, the other two would shout at them, Indonesia, Indonesia. And what that meant was that um, there's the Indonesian badminton team is one of the best in the world, if not the best, and they practice with bad umpires before going to international competitions. So they intentionally make terrible calls and try to maintain their composure through this, um, you know, potentially upsetting event. And I guess that to me has been something that, you know, it's not that I don't take the odd technical, but it's something that sort of is a steadying factor on something that usually if you play well enough, you're going to overcome something like umpiring if you feel it's an injustice. And anyway. Um, the second thing that she got working with me right away on was that she heard me a lot um, begrudging the success of higher goal players than myself. Um, and um, I would say, well, of course Facundo Pierres is 10 goals and 22 years old. He's had machines since he was this big and he's gotten to play 30 goal polo. and and um, you know, so of course he's that good. You know, how how can how can we do it without without getting those opportunities? And so, what I want you to write down now is what are a couple things that we can one could begrudge of higher goal players, and um, and instead, and the opposite, what are some things that. Uh, Let's see. What are some things that it could be easy to begrudge about higher goal players' success? Um, and what, how can we learn from them? That's your next question. So I did Jesse, Jesse, Remy, and Neil. Tori's found out that shoe making in 20 seconds. We'll find out. I just want to do this, by the way, folks. We, uh, I'm glad you guys are enjoying this bus while I'm going on a challenge here. We also know how to uh, play all of the equipment that have been signed in. So, we know how to do things. Let's do it now. Our program is going to start at the o'clock inside. Okay, you guys ready? Danielle? <laughs> you guys have been talkative. It's hard to concentrate. So I guess, um, what are some things that, that you could, uh, you know, begrudge a higher goal player? 
I guess I already said a couple things before, but. Well, I'm gonna say what Isabella just told me that, that he's a guy. Wow. Yeah. Gross, I mean, like, yeah. It, it's an easy excuse to say it's a guy. Right. Know, but there's ways around it too. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's. Um, and what are some things that, um, well, what, what, are, what are some things that you could learn from higher goal players? Well, I mean, just commitment, like going out every day and conditioning yourself and stuff like that and just taking the excuse of him being a guy off the table. Yeah, like yeah, mentally. right. No, 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 it does. Okay. Um, Ty? Something that you can learn from higher goal players. Um, what I, I, don't, I don't know if this answers it exactly how you want me to, but how I see it is they get they get to play games. I mean, almost every day, almost every other day. Yeah. Yeah. I'm always practicing or taking molly. Well, what I like see from it is maybe they play six chuckers a day. Yeah. It's in games, so they're thinking in like that game mode but right. I'm only practicing this thing Molly so what I do is if they're practice or playing six chuckers I try to ride maybe 12 horses you know they're on right. six horses a day I'm on 12 horses just trying to yeah you know, and just try and focus on when I'm in a practice try yeah. to think of it as a game maybe not make the bumps and the hooks as you would in a game but right right like try and try and think mentally like what would happen in that play yeah you know yeah I mean? yeah Absolutely. No, that's great. Um, is that two and two, or I still need one? Pedro, what's something you you can learn from higher goal players? Um, like if they always be to the play because they have better horses, always anticipate them more. Yeah. Yeah. One thing I used to do is when you do get to play a practice with a with a high goal player, is see if you can't find a way that you're the one marking them. And um, and then you know you're going to get beaten, but you're going to find yourself getting quicker for that for that assignment. Um, the other thing I do with Will, who has been working with me in Aiken, is when we have to play the horses quietly because some of you are, you know, maybe you're working for somebody else and they want you to play them quietly, or they're getting fit still try to be winning the plays but but without using the horse first but using your head first and these are all ways the other thing you touched on is to to do some mental work whether you're watching videos or or you're driving your car and you're thinking about the 26 goal game you watched and and sort of um, trying to put some of those aspects into your game I mean this is getting one step um, deeper into this discussion, but um, those are all great things. And I mean, uh, I guess what I, the point I'm trying to make is, it didn't get me anywhere to be like, oh, they're getting to play 12 chuckers a day and 30 gold polo. That doesn't help me. The way that does help me is to see what they have and what I can get from their skill and their um, accomplishment and what I did was go about it in a very deliberate manner there wasn't um, a team USPA program but I remember being really nervous about it but I said I'm gonna call Carlos Gracita and I'm gonna ask him if I can pay for a stick and ball lesson and and I I was seven goals I uh, you know I was trying to get as good as I could and it's amazing how much people will help you if you ask them um, and Carlos you know showed up he said meet me here and I brought two horses and we stick and balled and we talked polo for an hour and uh, then I you know would ask people to have lunch or breakfast and I would you know uh, have a talk with Pete Merlos or somebody that I admired um, the other thing that was part of my homework was to go down to the Polo Magazine office and look at every previous issue of Polo Magazine and read every article by a player that was higher rated than I was, or had been. And uh, it doesn't take you but two or three hours. And uh, so those are some things, those are some ways to learn and take and improve ourselves rather than be like, you know, woe is me. 
I haven't had these opportunities. Um, and I guess what Ani would have said is, think how good you are right now with not getting to play 12 chuckers a day. And take confidence, you know, take pride in that and then, I don't know, uh, these are some ideas. Let me see what I've written here. Um, I was sort of begrudging it because I was jealous. I was jealous of the horses, um, the money, the family, putting them in, you know, 20 goal practice games when they're really, really young. Um, and sort of had the attitude, of course they're that good, you know, but not appreciating that they have really done it on their own uh, on their own merit. And yes, they had a jump, but they also are are tremendous players. And I'm not only talking about Argentine players, but um, so the ways I learned were to keep my ears and eyes open, um, to be proactive about learning, not reactive. I mean. Um, you know, I, I found a way to go to Argentina because I felt I needed to do that um, to achieve some of my goals in the sport. And there'd be nights that I didn't want to go out, or I mean going out, I don't mean like, you know, but if, but if you think it's an opportunity to be around a 8, 9, 10 goal player and to absorb and just be a fly on the wall, it's, it's really, really helpful. Um, and uh, Hector Barantes used to hold court and he'd just talk horses non-stop. And one of the things you said, Hector used to say, it's not the hours, it's not the years you've been playing polo, it's the hours you've spent in the saddle. And so maybe that's something you can take heart that even though you're not getting to play six chuckers, you're actually putting in more work if you're riding for four hours a day and, and riding um, in, a, in a, you know, anyway, I'm getting onto horses, but we'll get to number three and then maybe we can get onto horses a little bit if there's time. Um, confidence. What does confidence mean for you and your polo? Um, and write one reason for believing in yourself on the polo field. What does confidence mean for you in the context of polo? Should be four left. <laughs> this is a biggie. Um, what is, uh, the reason to believe in yourself. Yeah, right, one reason for believing in yourself on the polo field. Okay, Felipe, you want to kick it off? <coughs> um, for me, confidence means that, means that um, when I'm in a game, every ball I go to, I just go for a win. You go for, I go for a win. So, like, I'm not playing to just take the ball away, I'm playing to win it. Yep, yep. Awesome. And, and what's one thing, I'm going to ask each of the four of you the two questions. So, what's one thing that you can feel good about? yourself 
The second part of the question. Uh, yeah, I wrote that up. One reason for believing in yourself. Is the only way to keep on improving? No, but something specific to you that you can feel good about yourself on the polo field. That's okay. You can think about it. Um, a, what are the other three that I haven't called on? What are your names? I'm Brett. Brett? I'm George. George, okay. Good. Brett, you want to? Um, I said for the first question, if, uh, if you don't believe in yourself, it's hard for others to. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, I couldn't really think of anything for the second question. Either. Okay. Uh, I mean, for me, confidence is having like a positive mindset in the day and just believing in yourself that you can win or you can do it. Yeah. And the second is believing. Uh, the second is important, and so far nobody's actually. I, I still really understand the question. I guess. Okay. Um, specific to you, what? Um, what is something that you can believe in yourself about? Like, even if you're having the worst day in the world, you still have this thing to go to and know that I can, I trust myself in this aspect. Maybe you're not hitting all your shots that day, but if you go to one man and take that man out of the play, then like you know that you've taken 25% of the team out there. Okay, Felipe, yeah. No, that's a good way to do it. But it's not exactly what I'm getting at. Um, no, I, I'm looking for something very specific. Go ahead. Yeah, you have both to do, right? Yeah. Okay. What's your name? Herndon. Herndon. First thing is, like, for me, confidence is everything. When, when, I, when I'm confident in my game, I'm confident in what I'm doing. I feel like, you know, I'm, I'm almost alone. But when I'm not confident... I'm so it means like you're almost alone out right, there. Right. Okay, when that's I'm great. not confident, I literally just can't get out of my own way. Okay. It's it pretty frustrating. Yeah. But one of the things I feel like that, you know, when it all comes back to this, is, is, is regardless of what's going on, I feel like I can maintain calm. You know, staying, staying calm to where it doesn't, it doesn't get to, the, if I have a bad truck or if I have a bad horse, if I can maintain uh, the right, if just stay calm. Not, right, not right. Rock the boat so much, then, you know, I have So basically, you day. believe in your calmness or your composure right. inside. Okay, well, this is a good example of something you can go to that you, you believe in. Now, if anybody would like to share something, are you about to share something, Isabella? Sure, I can. Go for it. I mean, um, well, I mean, confidence for me means being sure and clear-headed. Yeah. I just think it's like a clear head. I don't think it's being able to have like a good face. To yeah. And uh, I know I, you were saying something personal to ourselves. Yes. Um, For the second part yeah. of the question. Um, I don't know. I feel like when I go on the field, I can, I can think that I can either play, I can play both level-headedly or angry. I don't know, sometimes I play well angry and sometimes I play well level-headed and it doesn't really, I can I can play both and so that makes me kind of confident that if something goes wrong I can get right. angry. Right, if you happen to get angry you can still play it. well that way. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, these are great, these are great answers. Um, does anybody want to share something that they've thought of? Go. Oh, just for the, for the second part of that is really like why am I confident? I think so much of it comes down to, uh, like, even if I do have a really bad day, I know that I have a lot of improving left to do. And so as long as I'm working as hard as I can all the time to get better, if I right. have a crappy day that right. tomorrow, I'm going to go out and I'm going to play, you know, better the next day. I'm so that it's like a process. Day, right? It's not like win or lose, done or success. Exactly. Yeah. I think that's a really healthy way to think about it is that we're playing polo because we love it hopefully, and it's a process of improving. Um, these are great answers. I mean, I love positive. Uh, a few years ago, I was playing in Houston with Mariano Gonzalez, and uh, we had a team meeting, and it was raining like hell, and we had to play on a wet field, and we've been 
doing really well and he's like oh no you know it's raining the field's gonna be bad and I'm like that's great we're gonna we're gonna do well on a on a wet field because we're quick and then five days later it's like dry and we're on the fastest field there and and we had won our game on the wet field and he's like um, he said oh no now we're on a fast field against a four player team and I'm like no 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 we play really well on fast fields don't worry about it and he's like wait a second it can't be both ways you know and I mean that's directly from my knee just saying you know put a positive twist on it and maybe it's that you remember the best game you ever played on a fast field or you remember that you know I think me and Mariano are a little quicker than those other guys on a crappy field or whatever so there's I mean that those are some examples of the positive that one of you mentioned um, uh, I'm gonna give you because this confidence thing is a big deal there's a few definitions and all of your your things were really great um, one is uh, thinking good thoughts about yourself sounds simple um, another this is Tiger Woods is instant recall of past successes you know you're hitting a penalty shot and maybe you, th you remember that one you just hit beautifully and that's that's a good thing to uh, induce confidence um, and this is a little more golf believing you can hit the ball to your target um, and uh, and my favorite which my favorite is uh, confidence is playing with your eyes and um, and it doesn't mean that this is going to work for you all but for me playing with your eyes means playing with your with your senses without your mind getting in the way and um, and I guess it, it to me it means playing instinctively on the field looking and reacting looking and responding because you've practiced it enough and you've done the preparation before the game that when you get out there it's the fun and it's the it's the freedom that Alvin Ailey talks about in dis you know freedom through discipline and I guess that's what my goal is and it's a hard thing to achieve every every time you step on the field but I I really like that for me that definition of confidence um, uh, for me confidence is having a trusting mindset um, so the work I do on my swing or tactic or technique I try to do uh, quite a ways before the game um, because I guess I just want to trust myself when I go on the field and I want to trust my teammates and uh, something about um, believing in yourself that I knew used to say to me and I'd be like oh my god what am I going to do we're playing cambiasso you know it's going to be, you know, she's like, wait a sec, if you don't believe in yourself, why should anybody else believe in yourself? And it's kind of like, why give the belief to the other player, no matter how good they are, kind of go on the field that my goal is to play my best and to be myself. And I mean, I'm, I'm just now relating some of the things that I've worked on over the years. Um, um, trusting mindset, for me, it's to put the scoreboard away. Red knows this, We he coached a team with me and it's, it's sort of, when I'm too worried about the scoreboard, I'm not um, connected with what's going on inside the field between the boards and that's my objective is to just, just be playing, playing the game and that's um, why I play, I hope it's why you all play and, and the, I mean basically everything we want comes from playing the game inside the boards and if we play that well enough even if it is money or it's trophies or it's you know uh, you know impressing somebody on the sidelines that's the way that we do it everything's inside the boards and it's it's uh, in my opinion that's what's important um, uh, Another thing I, I do to myself to, to stay in it is, is uh, this was a, is to say, okay, next play. And the goal of that is to keep myself in the present because it's so easy to go like, oh, we're winning by two. I hope we hold on to this lead and 
my experience is the minute I start going that way, I'm not playing as well. And okay, next play is something, you know, maybe you say to yourself after you score a great goal or you make a terrible mistake because really that's gone and it's the next play that you're preparing for and trying to execute properly. Um, and uh, those were the three points that, that Ani initially started working with me on and it, you know, went from there but whenever somebody is intrigued by my work with a sports psychologist, those are the things that to give them a quick overview of what, what I've worked on and what I felt impacted my game in a positive way right away, um, those are the themes. And um, if you want to talk horses, we can. Um, yes, um, Chris. Adam, can you uh, just touch on real quick, um, how many goals were you when you got out of college and how do you, do you think, a lot of these guys are at a pivotal point in their life. Some are in college, some are thinking, should I continue college? Yeah. You know, do you have any thoughts on that? <laughs> Um, well, I went to college. I'm really glad that I did. Um, I, what I didn't really tell you about the story of starting with a sports psychologist, that what, I was lowered from eight to seven goals when I was 33 years old, and I was basically like, ooh, maybe this is a sign to hightail it out of this sport and, and get a more traditional career. Um, I went to college. I graduated in 87. I was four goals when I graduated. Um, and I don't think I ever really admitted that I was 100% committed to professional polo until I started working with a sports psychologist and basically identified the goal of trying to become a 10 goal player. And um, until that point, it was always like, well, this is a lot of fun. I'm making some money that I never could have expected to make. and. Um, um, I feel like having been to college it has helped me in my polo success and gives me confidence um, you know as I as I look beyond polo too I mean gives me confidence in that um, if I, I trust or I hope that or I believe that if I wanted to have a different career after polo that I that I could and that my education is part of the reason that that still could be available even though it would be starting at pretty late yes how did you maximize your uh, time to play polo in college you know I only played during the summer I was trying to play well I played ice hockey and the first two years I played lacrosse as well and my idea was that uh, I don't even know if I should say that but <laughs> I well we're being honest here my thought was I was playing outdoor polo during the summer I wasn't positive that indoor polo was going to help me if I wanted to be a professional polo player um, and my real goal had been to try to play division one college hockey um, and I never knew I was going to be a professional polo player until I got out of college, didn't know what I wanted to do, had a Fulbright Fellowship fall through that I wanted to go study the Olympics in, in Korea. Um, and had I done that, I don't think I ever would have been playing polo. That fell through. I knew I wanted to learn a language, spend time in a different country. And I went to Argentina with very little, uh, well, something was promised to me that fell through and one thing led to another and I got in a situation where I was basically working on a ranch with Hector Barantes. Um, and was down there four months, played eight practices the four months, so it wasn't like I was playing a lot of polo, but I was riding every day, eight horses, and I was listening to Hector, um, you know, hold court at every mate session and, and barbecue about, you know, this is the way to ride the horse, and this is the bridle to put on, and this is, and then I think our jobs and your job is to take what what works for you as an individuals, you know, like you take from red what works for you and your team and you as an individual player and I take from Hector and I take, so it's like 
you know, maybe taking is a harsh word, but, but we want to be open and we want to grasp what works for us and then integrate it into our games. But remember when you go on the field to, to play me, be yourself. And, uh, you know, sometimes that gets hard because you're looking at, you know, all these flashy players and you're watching this and it's like, oh my God, but, you know, really go to, you know, play you, you know, do the work, take it from wherever you get it, and, uh, and then go for it your way. You know, I guess I take heart in the, um, anyway, I'm getting off what you asked me, but I, I um, went to college, glad I went to college, um, but questions? How about just like a couple horse questions so I don't need to like launch into a horse? Do you want me to discuss horses a little or? or I, I we think it's like probably a very important part, right guys? Yeah. Um, yes. I guess just maybe you can start off with how you built your stream. Okay. Or during the summers or? Well, <laughs> I didn't own a horse until I was seven goals. Um, and I'm very, very lucky to have had that um, opportunity, or lucky, or or opportunity meets to not, to not own a horse. Because I look back, you know, my brother Nick is uh, well, Nick and Will, you know, they, and they've talked to me a lot because they went through the program last year, um, and uh, it, you know. How I did it, I got out of college, went to Argentina, had played well, won East Coast Open at four goals in myopia, which was an all-amateur team, and Stevie Orthwine told his brother, who played with me, that, there was, that I was a good player and he ought to think about trying to play with me in Florida. And then I didn't even know that deal was done until I was down in Argentina, and Alfonso Pierez, who we were playing with, called me up or called Hector and he put me on the phone and said, so I hear we might be playing with you. Um, I'm hoping you can buy some horses from me. This is Alfonso. <laughs> so he said, you know, I, ha I think I can send eight horses for you. Are you prepared to pay for them? <laughs> and I was like, well, maybe I can buy one for about $2,000 and that's about it. But um, he quickly learned that I didn't have any horses, um, but that Peter wanted to play with me because Stevie said that I was good. My father was lending me the six horses that were in the Snow Family Robinson string and two of those were good enough to play in the high goal polo and, and uh, um, George Haas gave me expenses in Gulfstream to play the 16 goal on the lesser four and he would give me two more and Peter gave me an apartment and uh, I brought my best two horses and gave me the other four. And it was a little bit different then because there were more teams that were mounting players. Um, and Alfonso went from not liking that, you know, I couldn't afford to buy eight horses to realizing, I mean, he did like to play with me too and we became friends, but he also realized that maybe it was good for him that I didn't have my own horses because the next summer we went to Greenwich and he had to provide horses for Adam to play with uh, um, Peter Orthwine and Brooke Johnson. And out of that summer, I developed a sort of a relationship with Brooke Johnson who basically mounted me for three or four years and um, got me to a level that I don't see how I could have done it with my own resources out of college. And I think that this is one of the real challenges that's, um, you know, that, 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 that is facing us with the development of players in this country is how, does, how do we afford to get better horses um, with the limited funds that we're getting paid. I, I think probably the, my best horses have been that way. Um, and. Um, you know what I look for? That when they say, oh, this is um, real easy, it's probably not enough for you, you know, it's a sponsor horse. I'm like, let me try that one. That's what I like. And when my wife likes to play them, which she doesn't play very much, but 
um, I almost always like them, you know, and they're the ones that go around on the loose rein and, you know, you kick a little harder, they go a little faster, you sit down a little more and they start slowing down. So, you know, I mean, I, uh, that, that's what I look for. Can't always have that, but, you know, um, playing Sunday, I mean, the other side of the horses is you can learn not only from polo, but learn from, you know, Buck Branneman and Monty Watt Roberts and everything you can learn outside the box only helps you with, you know, when you're dealing with your own horse and trying to get the best out of them. You know, Tommy Wayman has taught me a lot over the years about bidding and, you know, uh, there's a mare I'm playing on Sunday that plays in a full cheek snaffle and four reins and you don't see many snaffles around but I usually um, am experimenting until I find what I'm the happiest with um, bit wise, you know, and I guess the general thing is, okay, is it in a, is it a curb or is it a is it a gag and, and uh, broken pelham is something I do a lot kind of as that in-between stage. Um, anyway, that's good. Yes? What do you think is more severe? I know there's people think like gags are more, you know, severe than pelham. Yeah, well one of the things that everybody or a lot of people, particularly Argentines, think a full bridle, a double bridle is very severe. And I would say that a pelham and draw reins, in my opinion, is more severe than a full bridle and draw reins. Would you agree with that, Red? And my reasoning is that the leverage we have on draw reins, basically you're doubling your strength. And, uh, and that is going directly on the bars. Whereas when you have a Weymouth and a Bradoon, the draw reins are pulling on the Bradoon so that's acting like a snaffle, you know, a draw rein snaffle, basically. As far as uh, what's more severe, I mean, the times, I worry more about really, uh, you know, I'd rather cut a horse with a gag than with a pelham, basically, because when you cut them on the bars, that's, that can be serious, um, where the gag sores tend to be more flesh cheek things and maybe you can fix their teeth or put them in a broken pelham for a couple practices. And I do switch bridles quite a bit um, to rest their mouth um, or to get a little sharpness. I mean, some of the gag horses that take me a step, I'll, I'll try them in a broken pelham or in a full bridle or in a pelham just to see. Some of them like naturally have that curb boom. And uh, it's nice when you feel that. Um, but if they don't have that thing, then I'm probably going to keep them in a gag for most of them. Alfonso was one of my mentors, Pierre's, and he loved the egg butt gag and draw reins. So that was kind of when I got started, that was like every horse I could put in that I would. Um, I'm not sure I understand the loose ring egg butt. I mean, it definitely feels different, um, but I just would try horses in both and then decide which I like to play them more in. Um, anyway, questions, comments? I'm excited to uh, get to know you guys better. And, uh, and um, you know, I guess the last thing would be feel free to, to contact us. You know, I think that everybody has a really uh, everybody, meaning the, the high goal players and American based players, have a really positive, um, you know, attitude towards you and helping you all. And so take advantage of that and don't be afraid to email somebody or, you know, call them. Um, and good luck. Hope to see more of you. Thank you.